second person we have on our list is Luann Williams. Thank you, board. I, too, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Um, I just wanted to address the animal control ordinance, the part of it, just the portion that would require all dogs to be restrained um, inside kennels or homes or cars. While these type of leash laws are necessary in more urban areas, I do not believe that they are necessary here in rural Stanley County. Uh, many of your constituents are farmers or they're landowners that have significant tracts of land and they use their dogs for security purposes as well as farm uh, uses. And fencing in large properties is truly cost prohibitive uh, and putting dogs in kennels makes them virtually useless as um, protectors or crime deterrents. Um, um, when burglars were asked in a survey what would scare them away from a residence more than anything else, the answer dogs came in second only to the fact that maybe there were people inside the house. So many of us have dogs because we want to know when somebody comes on to our property. Um, my other concern is I wonder if Stanley County has enough resources to enforce this part of the ordinance um, equitably. If national t statistics hold true here in Stanley County, there's probably 8,600 or 8,700 households that have dogs. Um, do we have enough staff at animal control to enforce this across the county? And if we don't, how many more people are we going to have to hire and at what cost to the taxpayer? Furthermore, I feel like a lot of people are going to have to get rid of their dog if they can't provide a kennel or can't fence in or put invisible fencing. And if they do have to surrender their dog to animal control, then you're going to have more dogs coming to the pound, another added cost to the taxpayer. Um, should dogs stay on their owner's property? Absolutely, I believe they should. But do all dogs have to be pinned or uh, otherwise fenced or have electronic uh, invisible fencing in order to keep them on that property? I don't think that's necessary. I do understand, and I, my, I have a question too about the ordinance. From what I read, it said that dogs will stay on property or be restrained. And I have a question about that or. Is that or truly what it means? If so, then what I said may not be an issue. Um, but I certainly don't believe that every dog needs to be kenneled as long as it will stay on the owner's property. Um, I think that Stanley County has all the ordinances we need in, um, in regard to leash laws. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Dennis, I don't normally do that, but you, I think Ms. Williams asked a good question. Do, do you know, uh, I know this, this is 30 some pages long or whatever, but do you know the answer to her question? It says, I think your question was, the animal has to be on the property or restrained. And that, that is a little bit different uh, uh, question, I think, than maybe we've had before. And if you don't know, I mean, we, we'll, we'll just have to offer to, to find out. Based on, the, um, based on the types of restraint that are defined, uh, would be, it, it probably should be and instead of or on the owner's property and restraint because the types of restraint that we were looking at were um, those items that were listed there, uh, a kennel or fenced area, or it could be on the person's property if they you know, had it on a leash or was walking it. Um. Okay, thank Go ahead. Sure. I think she's referring to page 15. Uh, Article 4, Section 1, I read that today also, or H. Um, it says, the owner of a dog shall keep the dog on his property or under restraint at all times. A dog is under restraint if it is, and it lists uh, the, the type. seven things there. Right. And I think that it, it was a little misleading to me uh, when I was reading through those, that you might could have your dog out in the yard and have them tethered, but then if you read on, it's only if the property is being uh, fixed with a fence or something or repaired, as I read it. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. Sir. And, and I didn't want to I didn't want to disrupt the, the hearing so yeah. much as I just want to make sure that I answered your question. And I think Mr. McIntyre has probably found that. And, and so, and you have, I guess, Ms. Williams, you do have a copy of the ordinance. You could look that up on page 15. Okay.
a very, it's a very good point, and we will certainly continue to look at that and make sure that it's clear. Thank you. I think Ms. Daphne Smith was the next person I have on the list. Well, I disagree with, uh, my name is Daphne Smith. I live at 32 435 Guard Road. I was at your meeting last month and spoke about the dog ordinance because back in June, I was almost attacked by a pit bull and so was my daughter and one of my dogs was attacked by a pit bull. I feel the dogs that need to be restrained in a kennel is your mean, vicious dogs. Uh, we have small dogs. They like to get out and play in the yard. And in the area I live in, nobody complains about a dog coming in their yard unless they're vicious and they try to attack. And I have a lot of elderly people that live around. And I think about all of us elderly people that have to face things like the pit bulls. And the uh, shock collar sometimes doesn't work for them and the electric fencing does not always work either. And when I had animal control out to my house June the 25th, the pit bull that almost attacked me, that did attack my dog, had not ever been vaccinated or anything, but he was not picked up and taken to the kennel, taken to animal control. And I feel any dog that is not vaccinated should be picked up in an incident like that. Thank you. Thank you for coming back and speaking with us again, Ms. Smith. And the, other, the last person I have on the list is Ron Bryant. Thank you. I am Ron Bryant, uh, living in the fort and on a farm, large farm, with three farm dogs. And they have the run of the farm. They don't bother my neighbors. If they did, I'd have to do something about it. So I'd like for page 15 to keep the ore so I don't have to put a six mile fence around my property. Two of the dogs are strays. We adopted them. One of the dogs had a bad situation in Charlotte and we took it on also. Uh, we have folks who visit us sometimes who are elderly and whenever we have elderly people come, I put them on a leash before they arrive, put the dogs on a leash, because they're not vicious, but they might lick you to death. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to uh, speak? Yes, I would. Okay, if you will, uh, we'll just do it in one, two, three, your order, come on forward. As, and again, I would ask that you identify yourself. Uh, and I'm also Brian. then be aware that the manager is going to kind of give you some guidance as to how to speak. Okay. Uh, I'm Brian Smith. I live on Stony Gap Road. And with all due respect to dog owners, um, I'm, I own horses. And when I'm riding sometimes loose dogs, stray dogs, uh, actually chase us and make it a very hazardous situation as a horse owner to be riding a horse with two dogs or three dogs nipping at your horse's ankle as you're trying to ride. Um, I have called animal control several times, I think Officer Harris, and they have come out and written citations, but they have not followed through with any action to do anything uh, concerning these dogs. So um, it is an issue um, with dogs running loose. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I, Mr. Furr, I believe you, you raised your hand. Would you like to come up for one? Yeah, I, one other? I just want to say one thing. As a, as a son and a taxpayer and a law-abiding citizen, that, you know, you, if you're hunting beagles or bird dogs or coon dogs, it, you know, I have, when I go hunting, I got a thing about that thick with permission slip signed by the owners of the land that the wildlife has you to provide to get a ticket. And that's what I do. But you, the dog, you can't run him on a lead rope. He can't even run around a bit on a lead rope. Neither will a coon dog or bird dog. So I think there should be some revisions or something in here as a hunter that's, that's you know, that's abiding by the law, got his permission slips, 
you know, doing it all legal. I ain't talking about somebody that's out here just dumping their dogs out and running. And a lot of people do their deer hunt, and they get a bad name for it. And, uh, you know, one bad apple makes us all look bad, but not all bad. We just want, we just want some, well, we, we don't mind obeying the law. Just make it so we can. I mean, <laughs> just give us a chance. You know, we want 100 dogs, and they have to be running loose. And as far as them running the horses, if it's my dogs, I go there and make them quit running these horses and turn their hind ends up. Or put them, like you said, you know, and like I say, I do keep all my hunting dogs confined. Both, some of them are tethered, but not with no three-foot chain now. I don't believe in that mess. But, uh, you know, a successful son that will have some area can run, and I do pet my dogs and feed them like you should as a responsible dog owner. But I would hope y'all would have some visionaries here for us hunters. That, and, you know, this brings in a lot of money to the county, too. If y'all don't think about it, there's a lot of people that buy corn. There's a lot of people that uh, pay their taxes and buy hunting license and hunting clothes and go over at Walmart's one day, you know, and put out the hunting stuff and see how many people you see there. So just give us some leeway here so we don't make us, don't, don't make us be lawbreakers. We don't want to be. <laughs> just don't make us, you know, get caught or whatever. We just don't want to, we don't want, we want to bait a lot. One of the, one of the things that has been pointed out, um, that, that same section actually that when it speaks about uh, restraint, there is a section under there, it's page, on page 16, if you go back and look at your ordinance, it says a, a um, owner of a dog shall keep a dog on his property under restraint, and it's, restraint is defined um, under that section as under the control, this is number six, under the control of a licensed hunter while said dog is in the act of hunting. A dog is in the act of hunting when during a season designated for the hunted game, the owner of the dog holds a hunting license as required by the state of North Carolina, and the dog is, in fact, hunting for said game. So that, I do run all my dogs with shot collars so I can make them listen. That, sh that should cover your yeah. your request okay. uh, underneath there. And that's, that's obviously some of the things that we're looking at as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Come on up, Billy, and identify yourself in here. I'm Billy Nielsen from Albemarle. Uh, the provision that you just read, uh, the training, when I couldn't, I rabbit hunt with beagles, and according to that provision, the only time you can let them out is during the season. Well, it's just like I coach and I teach high school. We have to train our athletes, and you can't keep them pinned up and feed them all winter long and then turn them out and expect them to go and, and hunt. And as far as rabies concerned, we're out there with them. If there's rabies in the woods, I've been hunting rabbit hunting for 40 years, and I, I've not run, and usually the animals are sick. And if, if they are, our dogs will catch them. So I've been, I've been rabbit hunting for 40 years, and I know there's rabbit animals, but we've not had a rabbit, and I know it's rabbits, but we still, you, you run into raccoons, you run into animals, we're out there with them. One of the best resources, go to the hunters. They're out there. They don't have a yard that's in the city. They're in the woods. They go where the, the rabbit animals are. The thing about the stipulation, what is that, J or Number six. Number six. Okay. If you do keep that, there needs to be a provision so that we can train our dogs. Because you can't keep them pinned up all year. And as far as hunting dogs, there's hounds. And you can't say it's just a beagle because some of our best dogs are not purebred. And they don't fit the mold of a beagle. I've had some of, some of the best dogs I've ever had were mixed. And if you say just beagles or just, and also there's coon hunters, there's, and I don't know if, if all the hunters knew that we were doing this, this room would be full. But as far as the hunters, if you have fox hunters, you're going to have a dog, a hound will go after a fox for a mile. And to be in restraint of that dog, it's impossible. It's not feasible. So as far as being in restraint, you know, you're going to have to define what restraint is. And a dog can't, I mean, that's what we're worried about. And these dogs are worth, some of them's worth $200, $300, $400. And the gas you spend, and it's, it, you can't fit it into a mold to where, okay. I just want to, okay, okay. But anyway, that's, that's just a couple of things. And it's whether it's a lab and you're training for ducks and, and, you know, the hunters are probably the most conscious about the animals is being, being able to take care of them as far as the wildlife concerned, as far as the animals concerned. But you can't keep those beagles pinned up all year long and then take them out and say, okay, season's here, go hunt. You'll kill them. You know, sometimes even their feet when it's, the ground's froze. 
you know, you can't take them and run them on, fr on frozen ground and then take them out the next day and expect to run them again because their feet will be so tender because the ground froze. But thanks for letting me talk. Thank you. And uh, we have one more person, I think, who's, whose hand is raised. Again, if you'll come forward and identify yourself. How are y'all tonight? My name's Jerry Cotton. I have a kind of a unique situation. I live in Richfield, about 900 feet off the road, and there's a vacant lot or not a residence on it, and I got coon hounds or some kind of hounds behind me at 200 feet. It barks all the time. And so I, I've had the Sheriff's Department working with me. But what my request is, give the Sheriff's Department the Health Department something. Those things got me captive. I can't sleep. I have to cut the fan and the TV on to sleep. And if I'm out on my patio, you can't enjoy sitting out. I can't eat my breakfast or can't do anything in my gazebo at night. But please give the Sheriff's Department and the Health Department something to do about these dogs. It's barking. They just, they won't let up. And they got me captive in my house and outside my house. But if you would, just give them something to work with on this barking dog stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Ma'am, you come forward. Again, I would ask you to give us your name. <coughs> my name is Cindy Call, and um, I live up in Richfield. A um, couple very quick things uh, as far as the dogs being restrained on your property that also if they have to be restrained on the property that gives us no ability to play with them okay or let them stretch their legs we have a nice yard for them but they they still enjoy t running and stretching our kids enjoy playing with them um, throwing the ball frisbee whatever it might be they need that freedom to run um, without us having to like they said you know fence the whole place um, the other thing it talked about that the wearing the rabies tags at all time um, our dogs also like to rustle and tussle and those tags don't always stay on their collar um, you might want to give that a little consideration um, I keep them where I can find them very quickly as well as their county tags um, but you know I don't want them to swallow them or lose them um, but anyway um, we also in the past have used a, a cable run um, which we only use periodically, I think that that gives them freedom and, and again, not so close that they don't have room to run. But um, the other big thing that I would like to is kind of changing gears completely is um, the part um, about um, inherently dangerous exotic animals. Um, you have a, um, a part in there, um, it's section or line five says reptiles, insects, or arachnids, which are venomous or a constrictor, not indigenous indignant that's the word uh, to Stanley County I've been practicing that all day um, anyway we at Christ the King Christian Academy have a ball python who obviously is not native to this area um, he uh, a ball python is not one of your Burmese or reticulated pythons that are going to get uh, umpteen uh, feet long he at most will get to be 36 to 48 inches um, though some have grown to 60 inches that's five feet uh, he will not get big. He's not dangerous. He's very docile. The kids love him. He's a wonderful education tool. I don't want to have to get rid of him. Um, he's, the kids love him, like I said. Um, he's been in the yearbook a few times. Uh, he's, he's just, I don't want him to, so I, if you could consider um, some other definition than just a constrictor, um, possibly a size limit, you know, no constrictor which will as an adult be over seven feet or something like that. I would appreciate that because it would make a lot of us sad if we had to get rid of, get rid of him. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Call. Um, anyone else that's here tonight to speak concerning the um, this ordinance? Yes, ma'am, you wanna come forward? I'm the Stanley County Humane Society's president, and I do agree with the te not the tethering, but the restraining on the property. I get probably 30 to 40 calls a day of stray dogs that somebody found. You know, maybe they were out running around big farmlands. It doesn't matter. I'm tired. I mean, I'm wore out. Exactly. I mean, I'm, it's unrealistic to expect everybody to have their dogs spayed or neutered, but 
having them running around everywhere. They're just breeding and breeding and breeding. And I'm tired. I mean, I'm tired of having to tell people, no, I can't take your dog. I'm full. So I agree with the restraint and all that. So that's it. Thank you. And I believe I actually called you recently because we had someone who was interested in uh, getting some information like that. So I appreciate your service and what, what you're doing. Anyone else? Ron, one more? And then it'll be, that'll be it. My dogs are spayed and neutered. <laughs> there you go. I would um, at this point declare the public hearing closed and um, uh, would entertain any comments or, or questions that the commissioners would have. I have a question. Uh, under keeping stray animals, I just need some clarification, I think. What page? Page 22, Article 7. Uh, actually, okay, Section 2, keeping stray animals. Unlawful for any person to harbor, feed, or keep in possession by confinement or otherwise in any stray animal which does not belong to him or her. And it goes on to explain some of that. The question I have, uh, I live in the country. Uh, people put out their animals, females usually, that are pregnant, and uh, so they don't have a home. But when those babies are born, if I wanted to keep one of them and adopt it, does this prevent me from doing that? The way it reads, it does. Uh, but I mean, it just says I have to report that within 72 hours. Does that mean <coughs> report and surrender or? Dennis, if you would come back up to the front so that uh, we can hear your answer. Thank you. The intent of the reporting is to perhaps hopefully identify an owner that may be looking for the stray. That's, that's the main on the front end, and you probably gathered that. I don't think the intent for, at this case, you're talking about the, the, the mom has the offspring. Um, I don't think it, I mean, I see what you're saying. I don't, I don't, it, I don't think it was the intent that you couldn't uh, keep them. It was to, because uh, those are new, those are new, those are new animals that are, that are, uh, that are entering. They still actually belong to that owner of that dog that had Correct. the puppies. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, but obviously he didn't want them anyway. Well, if it's in fact a you know a stray that's been dumped, but I mean if it's one that's out that the owner's looking for it, then the idea is that you want to get that animal back to. I mean, there there should be a way in which if that happened that there would be some adoption <coughs> opportunity, theoretically, but that was the whole reason why the. Uh, the 72 hours was was in place. I, I'd like to make a suggestion and um, see if the other commissioners are interested in doing this. Um, th the, um, I think we've come a long way on, on this, and this is newly revised, and I know that there's the health, health board did a lot of good work on it. This is the first opportunity that I'm aware of that we've had uh, to, to get this input. I'm wondering if we could send it back to the health board uh, with the input that we've gotten. Uh, we'll provide you other input that we've received also by emails and otherwise. And have, have you look at this, especially the specific items that have been addressed. And um, I know you have great resources to compare this perhaps to what other counties are doing as well. Um, I had actually the same question about the um, snakes that are not indigenous and that kind of thing. Um, so I wonder if we could, I don't want to prolong it, Dennis, but at the same time, if we can kind of pitch it back to you. And, and it, I know we have one commissioner on the board. Um, let you have a conversation about that. If we needed to add another commissioner to, to that conversation, I think we could, we could do that. And see if we can't do some refinement and then, and then bring this back and look at it again. It may not require another public hearing, but it certainly could, could um, I think we could do some refinement now. That's just a suggestion, fellow commissioners. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Well, first, let me say I agree with that, and I think we need to maybe to have time for some more input. I'll tell you a story, and a kitten was thrown out. I found it in my bushes, 
It was very, very young. I didn't know how old it was. And it was on a holiday. But I called uh, Animal Control. I had a private number. And I learned that if this kitten was under four months of age, they would not take it. So after the holiday passed, I'm over at the vets, and I'm saying, it's not my cat, but it's hurt. It's injured. It's got infection. But it's not my cat. What's his name? Well, I haven't named him, you know. In a sense, I would have been in violation of this ordinance. But, you know, $180 later, I've got a healthy cat. Uh, he <laughs> He's scheduled. He has an appointment to be neutered. And I... At essentially have broken the law if this had been in place. I would say you're a good owner. I'm a responsible <laughs> owner after I violated the law. Uh, Thank I, you. Uh, I would say I certainly don't mind taking it back and looking at it. I think the issue, uh, it's exceedingly difficult to create an ordinance that's going to please everyone. Uh, We've gone round and round with this, and I mean, I'm not uh, saying that we can't. I mean, I, as I said earlier, we want to try to do what we can to be as realistic as we can, but we don't want to infringe on people's inherent rights. But we also need to protect the situations that occurred in Fort Mill and in Weddington where children were mauled and, and other issues. Responsible pet owners uh, are going to guard against that and it's not that's not what we're looking for it's the other issues that our officers are faced with uh, where they need tools to be able to be as effective as they can be so I mean I certainly understand the concerns that people have and we will uh, go back and look at tweaking some of these areas and if uh, uh, questions that y'all have if you would get them me, to let me let's find out first of all if that's what commit that's just a suggestion oh, okay. i want right. to make well, sure though that if the commissioners are, are okay with that or whether that's what they would like to have some alternative action taken or not mr chairman i'd like to make a comment too uh dennis and, and especially on the one that brought up about hunting i'd already thought about that because i i don't rabbit hunt anymore or don't coon hunt anymore don't fox hunt anymore but uh got a little too old for that but i do enjoy hearing the rabbit dogs run they got to have some time to train their dogs, so we need to take that. And, and to me, I don't know how you're going to fix it. It leaves too much lateral to make it up your own rules as you go. Uh, it sort of leaves a lot of gray area where the officer could go in and say, well, that's, this is the way it is, and, you know, you may not read it that way. So we've got to be careful with that. And uh, I know there's some a uh, lot of rural areas in this county if you don't have your dog out there, if there's a crime going to happen, the only thing the sheriff can do is come to the scene because the damn crime's going to be happening until he gets there. With a barking dog sometimes prevents it. So. And I agree with that lady on the barking dog. But uh, I've got a beagle, and she barks everything comes up. And uh, I do let her run out some during the day, especially when I'm mowing the yard. She's with me everywhere I go. But uh, she's not on a leash either. Uh, I just think we need to be some real thought to that leash law for the county. Uh, I don't know how you're going to make it work, but uh, I know for the urban area, I could understand that. But you're looking out there like uh, where, uh, oh, I can't even call his name now. <laughs> yeah, Ron, Ron, where he lives down the forks of the river. I mean, Lord, he's way back off the road. And uh, we, I mean, I grew up on a farm. We always had a farm dog. So. And it wasn't for stray dogs. I don't guess my daughter would have any dogs. So she, everything comes up, she goes to the vet. First thing it does, gets all the shots and current and run ad in the paper why well, lost a dog but it's had all the shots anyway and you know you you're looking at like that at the forks he got 1300 acres down there he can't let his dogs run loose now, that ain't gonna suit that man too well and that's according to your law he can't <laughs> yeah is there any other any other comment by commissioners at this time Sounds like to me that there is a consensus. I don't know that we have a motion, but it seems that there is a con consensus to, to, for us to continue to work with you and see if we can make some changes. And I, uh, comment I know I made when I, when I was talking to the manager is that um, we, we, we're in the state of flux here in, in North Carolina. We're, we're a rural county, but at the same time, we have a lot of places that we need urban type services. And, and like you said, Dennis, trying to match those up uh, one of my questions actually 
to the manager, I believe was, um, can, the, can the towns supersede the county's ordinance or, or do they have their own ordinances? Because some of those urban type services might be, might could be provided by towns and then the county wouldn't necessarily have to have something that is, is, is uh, as, uh, as far scoping. But it does sound like that what we'd like for you to do is to go back and, and take the information that will be provided by the citizens and by commissioners and see if there's some areas for us to review it. And then we'll certainly want to continue to work with you and see if we can't come up with something that addresses the, especially these issues that we've, that we've heard about. Okay? Okay. Thank you. And again, we appreciate the, the folks who are here tonight. Um, just know that, that this is not over, obviously. We're, we want to continue to work on it. I think you've heard the concerns both from um, the health department uh, and from commissioners uh, that we want to address as, as broad an issue as we possibly can um, and, and, and meet all the, the, the needs that we have as best we can. And we'll continue to work on that. So thank you. Mr. Chairman, could I make one comment? Certainly I not. said a while ago I didn't have one, but uh, uh, one of the comments that was made tonight was about the noise and the barking of the dogs and, and uh, being held captive in your house. And uh, if there's other problems like that, there is a, there is an ordin a noise ordinance uh, that the sheriff can take care of. And uh, so I don't know that we need to take steps in the dog ordinance for that, but uh, do know that there is, do uh, there is a noise ordinance for any time of the day uh, that the dogs are making noise, that there can be something done about it. And I think the sheriff has worked well with that and, and will continue to do that, I'm sure. So just make you aware of that if you do have that problem. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate you mentioning that. That was actually one of the questions I asked the manager. Do, did the ordinance need to address that? And I think it, we can address noise in other ways. So thank you so much. Next item on our agenda is um, uh, we're uh, inviting Melanie Hollis, with our library director, to come and and she wants to speak with us about a, a potential proclamation. Good evening. Um, you have before you a proclamation that I'm hoping that you will pass tonight um, on our 411 Community Read Project. And I know Tyler passed you out some of our brochures this has been a huge project that the library is part of. We are also working with the Albemarle Parks and Recreation and the Stanley County, uh, Stanley Community College Library. And we are working with Cabarrus County, Rowan County, and Union County, their libraries, their parks and recs, and their community colleges to put this whole program together. And just so you know, this beautiful brochure was paid for by Cabarrus County. <laughs> no Stanley County funds for uh, this beautiful brochure. But what we've been doing, we've been meeting once a month for about nine or ten months. All of these different groups coming together and planning this uh, program. And so it's taken very little um, time or money from any one organization to put this together. Um, we here at the library are spending approximately $200 um, on this program. And it's just to get everybody in the community reading and talking about the same book, which is The Hunger Games. Um, I'm sure you've seen the, the previews for the movie that came out recently. And I think you all got a copy of the book um, in April. So uh, I just brought the proclamation this evening for um, hopeful approval from you. Would you like me to read it in all its whereases? <laughs> um, maybe not. Um, <laughs> maybe I've fall, fallen into that once already. I, I would like for you, though, to maybe pick out a couple of the points and explain just a, in a little more detail how the partnership with the other counties works. Can, is, is that a fair question? Sure. Sure. Um, just to let people know that we are working across the counties in order to have these events. Mm -hmm. And it is a program that is for children, for teenagers, and for adults. Um, if you go through the brochure, and if I can, Tyler, can I leave some brochures out on the table? And I'll pick up any extras tomorrow. Um, but there are programs scheduled throughout the four county region that are applicable for different age groups. And um, 
the library, we're showing a couple films, the Parks and Recs Department here at um, uh, City Lake Park is going to have a film. Parks and Rec is going to have a survival training day. Um, I think they're going to do some knot tying. I don't think we're going to do any bow and arrows um, just because of the hazards, but rock climbing and those sorts of things that um, the characters did in the movie. Um, several of the other Parks and Recs departments across the four county area are also doing this. And then we're going to come together at the end on October 13th at the Cabarrus Arena and Event Center and we're going to have a final obstacle course hoping to put some of this training into use. Um, there's going to be mud and we'll run heats through it and we'll have the winners of all of the contests. There's a bookmark contest, a writing contest, a costume design contest, open for um, grades um, 6 through 12 I believe. So we're really trying to get all age groups in, involved and um, get, you, get people moving around the county. If you can't make the survival training day here in, in Stanley County, then you are more than welcome to go to one of the other counties and participate in their projects also. Very good. And I think that's what I just want to make sure that people understood, that this is something that involves four counties. Four counties, uh, one book, one community. One book and you're uh, offering the different activities that can reach anybody's interest from just the book reader to mm -hmm. someone who mm -hmm. wants to be very, very active, active. and involved mm -hmm. in any kind of recreational type activity that's connected to it. Uh, you presented this when the, our board met with your board, I think it was in April or May. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very interesting concept and it's the first, thing, first uh, time I've ever heard anything like it. So it is very interesting. So. Um, uh, given that, uh, fellow commissioners, uh, what's your pleasure? I make a motion that uh, we uh, approve the proclamation. Second. Resolution. We have a, a motion to a approve the proclamation by Commissioner McIntyre, second by Commissioner Louder. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. We look forward to all the activities that you're going to be uh, having, and I'm sure that uh, you'll be letting us know what's going on. I will. Us. Thank you very Thank much. You. Next item on our agenda is uh, from the Sheriff's Office. Uh, presenter is uh, Sheriff Rick Burris. What you got for us tonight, Sheriff? Good afternoon. Some weeks ago, uh, I came before the board and requested that uh, we be allowed to share in a cost-matching uh, technology grant that the city had applied for, which uh, y'all gave me approval to do this. Tonight I come before you to try to transfer this money from uh, our pay tail. Uh, it's an inmate telephone service to, uh, to, uh, to satisfy these matching grants. This is a $60,000 grant, 25% matching fees. Our, our part of that is $7,500. Uh, I would like to add that this is no cost to the uh, to taxpayers uh, for any of these transfers. This is uh, Drug seizure money, pay tail, inmate service money, that's uh, revenues from, from the jail. Any questions on, on that, I'll move to the next meeting. Okay. Um, that's, uh, the sheriff actually has two items, and the first one is the uh, approve a budget amendment that would transfer this money for the items that he just discussed, and then he has a second. He has a second item he wants to discuss in just a minute, but let, let's do the motion first of all. Well, I'd entertain a motion concerning this uh, budget amendment. I make a motion. I make a motion that we approve the budget amendment 2013 for transfer of the money. Second. We have a motion and a second. A motion by Commissioner Dennis, second by Commissioner Louder. Uh, are there any other questions? All in favor say aye. aye. Uh, any opposed? So, and what's your second item? Uh, the second. Uh, uh, movement of money would be for uh, our two canines. We've got two canines that uh, around seven and a half years old. One of them has some severe health issues. In fact, it's got a fractured ankle. Uh, it's kind of out of service as far as apprehension and any extenuant, uh, uh, strenuous exercising. Uh, it's on medication. Uh, and I have also located two canines from a uh, company, Vigilance uh, International. They uh, are, they have an office in Statesville. Uh, the main company is out in California. They are trying to work their way into North Carolina. Statesville has purchased canines from these folks. Uh, the city of Almont has also purchased one. 
And for the first 10 canines they sell, they're going to sell at $9,500. Now, for the past two canines that we've purchased here in this county, I, we paid $14,000. Now, this includes training, uh, the, whole, the whole nine yards to get the dog ready to do the, the required uh, work uh, that he has to do. Uh, two of these dogs are going to cost us $19,000. Uh, if, if, if they're getting very close to retirement age, uh, as I said, they've got some health issues. One of the dogs is still a pretty good dog. But if we don't go ahead and do this, we'll end up having to pay uh, a lot more money less than six months from now, and they're going to have to be replaced. The normal working years for a, a K-9 is eight years, and both of these dogs are getting close to seven and a half years old. Uh, the $9,500, it would be a total of $19,000, which I'd like to move from our federal drug seizure money. Uh, and if we can get that done, then I'll, I'll go on to the, to the next one. Uh, we've got some state seizure money that I'd like to also uh, move $3,500. Uh, this will be for heat sensors that go in the K-9 vehicles. Uh, I have put this off for some time, so I've got a letter that I've, has been written by our uh, veterinarian that takes care of these animals that highly recommends that we put these sensors in the car. What this does, if the temperature is set at a certain range and it exceeds that temperature, the officer within seven-tenths of a mile would be paged and uh, he would know that he had a problem where the dog wouldn't have maybe die from hypothermia or whatever the case may be. Also, this money would be, these, these uh, units cost, we've got a, a discount, they're around $6.95 a piece. They said they'd sell us four for $6.25. That's going to come up to $2,500 and some odd dollars. We also need to buy two pins, which is going to be $500. And I checked with Stalling Salvage, the materials to build a platform to set these pins on is going to be $500 for both pins. So that's, uh, that's the state drug seizure money. And as I said, this is, uh, this is no, no cost to the taxpayer. So the second item the sheriff is presenting tonight is to um, uh, ask for uh, approval to transfer money from the federal forfeiture funds and the state drug seize funds for the items that he described, the purchase of the canines that includes training and the units to help them with the temperature controls and the, and the pens and so forth. So that's, that's what he's requesting tonight. What's your pleasure? I have a motion by Commissioner Lauer to approve this um, a budget amendment to allow for these uh, expenditures. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Dennis. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Thank you all very Thank much. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. It was not in it, Sheriff. I believe there's a third item. That's the, um, the dogs being um, retired, transferred. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Also, I would like to uh, request that the board allow these uh, dogs to be given to their handlers. Uh, we will get a release of liability at the time that we do turn them over to the handlers. I make a motion that we authorize them to go ahead and retire the dogs. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Dennis, second by Commissioner McIntyre to approve the retirement of the two canines and to transfer the ownership to um, those individuals that uh, they have presented to us. Uh, any questions about that? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Again, thank y'all. Next item on the agenda uh, is pertaining to a 2011 CDBG infrastructure hookup grant, and our presenter tonight is our utilities director, Donna Davis. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, um, and thank you for your time. I'd like to present for your consideration this evening a um, actually three items related to the, the hookup grant and just for the benefit of uh, the public I would like to explain a little bit about what the hookup grant is. Uh, the hookup grant is basically funding from uh, community development block grant which is federal funding that comes through the state of North Carolina Department of Commerce to local communities to provide funds for low moderate income households to be able to connect to our water and, so water and sewer system. Uh, we understand that as difficult as the economy is now, uh, sometimes it's very difficult for people to access the public utilities that are available to them, sometimes right in front of their homes. And so we have consistently applied for grant funds from the state of North Carolina to assist with this. And I'm proud to say that uh, the county has received um, in excess of uh, three quarters of a million dollars worth of grant funds of this type to provide uh, help of this type to citizens in Stanley County. 
This particular grant is $75,000. Um, it requires no matching funds from the county. And um, this is all, again, federal money that is uh, uh, administered by the State Department of Commerce. There are three things associated with this particular grant. Uh, it has been awarded to Stanley County. And uh, what I'm requesting this evening is approval from the Board of Commissioners of the policies, procedures, plans, and resolutions that are given to us by the program administrators with the Department of Commerce Com uh, Division of Community Assistance. The second, and I, I'll, the second item is the award of the Administrative Services Contract to Carolina Governmental Services, uh, LLC. Uh, there were two um, submissions for administrative services, Stephen S. F. Austin and uh, Carolina Governmental Services, LLC. We're requesting that uh, it be awarded to Carolina Governmental Services, LLC, which is a new name in our community, but the, uh, the folks who are actually doing the program administration are uh, are people who've been working with Stanley County for the last several years and successfully have helped us administer these grants and stay within uh, the Department of Commerce regulations and, um, and the, the rules that they require. And the third item is approve the associated project ordinance and budget amendments that would recognize these funds in the county's uh, budget and allow us to begin to spend those for the citizens of this community. Thank you, Ms. Davis. That was very well explained, and I think that we have a, have a good understanding of it. I, I think we can do all three of these in one motion, but let me first of all ask if there are any questions um, from commissioners. Uh, hearing none, um, we'll, we'll entertain a motion uh, and to, to consider these three items, if you'd like. Mr. Chairman, I would make a motion that we approve all three of these items as one. Okay. We have a motion by Commissioner McIntyre with a second by Commissioner Morton to approve uh, the uh, package of policies, procedures, plans to award the administrative services contract to Carolina Governmental Services and to approve the associated project ordinance and budget amendments. Uh, all in favor say aye. Any opposed? Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. We look forward to providing these services to our citizens. The next item on our agenda um, is related to the uh, 2013 revaluation. And uh, with us uh, as our presenter tonight is Malia Miller, our tax administrator. I believe you've got a member of your staff, if you'll introduce him, we, we, I'd appreciate that. I do, thank you. Good evening. I'm Malia Miller, tax administrator. This is Charles Johnson, real property supervisor, Stanley County. Hi, Charles. Um, he, he's heading up the revaluation for 2013. Um, he'll, he'll give you an update on the revaluation. I had several things I wanted to go over with you and then, then he'll provide an update for you. Um, I'm here tonight to officially submit the proposed 2013 schedule of values. Uh, there are two schedules of values. You have them in your packet. One is for the market value, one is for present use value, which is also known as, uh, sometimes as farm value. Uh, the, the Department of Revenue suggests that these two schedules be adopted separately. Uh, the adoption order, which you'll be asked to approve at the October 15th meeting will clearly identify that it's two separate schedules. Um, there are several things. You've got a timeline in your packet also. You should have a timeline. There are several items that uh, require board involvement, tonight being one of them, that we submit this schedule of values. That's per North Carolina state statute. The second item will take place this Thursday. There will be a notice of public hearing. It will be advertised in the Stanley News and Press with the public hearing being held at the October 1st Board of Commissioners meeting. From October 1st to the 15th, we will hear any comments that, that anybody may have on the schedule and the proposed schedule should be adopted on October 15th. You'll notice there are four publications of notice of adoption. Those are by statute. They're required to be published in the local newspaper. And then if there is an appeal to the Property Tax Commission, the last day to do that will be November 19th.
I hope you've had a chance to look at the schedule of days, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them at this time. Are there any uh, questions at this time from commissioners? Uh, just one, Malia, and that is on the uh, schedule of values on page 87. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the last page, it sums it up for Stanley County property owners, but you'll notice that it says non-productive. That's a term in the present use of the value schedule that I, I didn't find it defined in the schedule. What does non-productive mean? Okay, I'll try to explain that. Um, the statutes don't define non-productive per se. Uh, what the statutes do say, and if, um, if you would, let me find the page. Page 73, where it defines the different classifications of land, mm -hmm. agricultural, forest land, and horticultural. Mm -hmm. and, and within the definitions of that, We'll just take the first one. It, it runs the same through each. Agricultural land includes woodland and wasteland. Let me give you an example. If you have a 100-acre tract that qualifies for present use value, and in that 100 acres, you may have the open agricultural land that's producing crops. You may have woodland that may be used for, for different things, um, erosion barrier, mm -hmm. you know, different things. And then you may have non-productive land, wasteland. That's the land that, that is priced according to this, the $40. That land's a part of that unit, but it doesn't qualify for any of, it's not, it's not being farmed, it's not serving as woodland. Um, so it, it's actually just wasteland. Um, and it does have to meet certain criteria, and, and that's listed in here. Um, Stanley County is in, the um, region 136, the Piedmont, and there are some tables in here starting on page 45, and it lists different, it goes to page 63, I believe, 63, and it lists all different types of soil, and, and then you look at the three classifications, the agricultural, forest land, or horticultural mm -hmm. property. And, and where you see with the agricultural or horticultural, the number four, those are types of properties that are generally approved as non-productive wasteland. Um, in some cases, you could have one of these properties that may be producing, but uh, that, I hope, explains a little bit of it. Sure does, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Um, well, Lee, I was mm -hmm. I was new to the county commissioners, or fairly new. Whenever we looked at these schedule of values before, when, when the commissioners decided to delay revaluation, and I admitted to the manager today that I almost need a uh, kind of revaluation for dummies. Uh, I think that your your explanation um, to Jan's question here um, kind of open kind of peels back one of the layers of the onion, so that our, our citizens can understand. How, how difficult it might be to get revaluation down to where they can understand it. But mm -hmm. uh, you, you've done a good job in just explaining that question. <laughs> I learned a lot just in that. Okay. But um, um, I, you're gonna, these, these documents will be provided uh, for the public uh, yes. to be able uh, to look at. And especially, I think the other, the other note, Brett, that, that uh, you didn't direct your attention to tonight, the bigger one, actually has a lot of great information at the very beginning. And, and uh, again, as I've done in the past, I, I just encourage the citizens to, and you may gonna be talking about the 10 minute trials, I don't know, but I just encourage people to kind of look into it and understand it better because there are a lot of details. I think one of the things this board has, has sought to do this year is to talk about revaluation more so that our citizens understand it better. But it's still one of those dark clouds, I think, that uh, a lot of people don't get. But uh, in this notebook, it talks about the differences of between um, fair market value, and especially that's important in, in our economy, and then the appraisal value and things of that nature. So mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any 
magic bullet or any kind of, like I said, descriptive term for gummies that you could provide us, but uh, certainly uh, this, this information is critical, I think, as our citizens move forward to try to understand exactly what we're all about during this process. Mm -hmm. and, and we're going to try to make sure the information is available. Um, we'll, we'll have a question and answer page on the, on the uh, county's website. Um, the schedule of values are in the public libraries, they're in the tax assessor's office, and then they're in the central administration office for the public. Um, we'll be happy to answer any questions any taxpayer has and explain as best we can. And I appreciate that. I think more than anything else, and I think I speak for all of us up here, the, our, our major function is try to get to the end of this where there's no surprises. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that really takes um, um, the, the fine effort that you and your staff are making the actually new software that the county purchased to try to make it better and easier and, 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 and uh, more effective, more efficient. But it also, I think, takes the responsibility of the individual citizen also to invest a little bit to understand some of these mm -hmm. things too. So I'm just encouraging that to take place tonight. So well, uh, thank you. don't and let me interrupt what, what else you have to say um, to us tonight. The other thing is uh, Mr. Johnson was going to just give you an update where we are on the 2013 revaluation. If there are no other questions on the schedules. Good evening. I, I wanted to give you an update as far as where we stand with the current reappraisal. Uh, right now, uh, we have done an initial on-site inspection of all 37,000 real property parcels in the county, and that was completed as of May 18th, 2012. Currently, uh, we are doing final reviews of all our values. Uh, that is an in-office review. And to date, as of, uh, let's say, August 31st, we had done 16,000 parcels, or 43% of the county. Uh, we're using the market or sales comparison approach, tempered by the cost approach right now. Uh, foreclosures or short sales of property cannot be used in North Carolina due to state statutes because they're not arm's length transactions. But we are using uh, what arm's length transactions we have, and we feel like those will reflect the depressed state of the market. Even though we're not using short sales or foreclosures, the arm's length ones are being impacted by the overall market. And we feel like our adjustments will reflect, hopefully, you know, the current state of affairs. Uh, we anticipate mailing revaluation notices towards the end of February. As you know, in the past, we've always done it around December. And we want to wait to see uh, exactly how the market shakes out and we want to wait till at least the end of the year and give us a little bit of time to analyze an entire year's worth of sales before we send out notices. So we're, sh we're anticipating towards the end of February, send middle to end of February, sending out initial valuation notices for 2013. Uh, once taxpayers get those notices, they can contact the tax administrator's office to set up an office appointment uh, to speak with an appraiser. We will actually see you in person. We won't make you mail in anything. We want to actually hear from the taxpayer and listen to their concerns uh, face to face. Uh, and we will put out on the website the number they need to call to reach us and we will have it on the forms. So if any concerns or questions arise, feel, feel free to call us and we can schedule an appointment for them to come in to see us and we'll be happy to answer any questions that they may have. We'll have the uh, all of our resources available to us in the office so we can answer hopefully anything they may bring up at that time. Uh, let's see, uh, and overall we, uh, even though we've done about 43% of the parcels in the county, we're not really expecting to see a, a countywide increase in value. I mean, you know, the last time we did a reappraisal was 05. You know, the market has kind of obviously went up and it's back down uh, and it's kind of, kind of bumping along, I feel like at the moment. But like I say, we're analyzing these sales as they come in monthly. Uh, we have public relation efforts on, uh, underway. Uh, currently, I'm in talks with the IT department about getting the schedule of values posted on our website. Uh, we have a question and answer sheet to be posted on the website, hopefully by this week. And we also have meetings with uh, the folks at the senior center scheduled for uh, November. And we also have, uh, we anticipate trying to get up and schedule appointments with the uh, local media so that we can get, uh, inform the public of uh, what we're doing. Since it has been, you know, eight years since we've had a real appraisal. So, and, and you know, it's, it's been a tough real estate market. We need to get, get uh, let people know what's happening. 
So uh, if, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to uh, try to answer them. Commissioners, are you have any questions tonight? Hearing none, I, uh, as you said, there's no action required tonight for the commissioners. You're presenting this information to us, and we will follow the, uh, the uh, schedule that you've, you've provided as well. We look for a public hearing to be held on October the 1st. But uh, we certainly appreciate uh, – did I say something wrong? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Um, no I'm, I tell you what, I'll be honest with you. I, I uh, don't do this often, so I'm I, uh, fairly nervous. So I'm just enjoying, uh, you know, trying, trying to be as helpful as possible yeah, in a difficult a situation. When I, said, when I said public <laughs> hearing October 1st, you looked at I had a, I thought I saw a question mark. No, but, no, um, I understand fully what, uh, what that involves. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yes, ma'am. <laughs> Let me um, let me express my appreciation, and I think I speak for all five of us on, on, like you said, this is something that we haven't done for eight years. And so it is important that we communicate and that we go to the, to the next length, that you guys sound like you're doing very well in trying to make sure that we uh, educate the public on what this is about, because this is something that everybody's interested in who owns property. And so I uh, appreciate all your efforts that you're making and for the continuing reporting as we go through the process uh, so that people will understand it. No other comments? We Thank appreciate you it. So Have a nice we'll see you next time. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Next item on the agenda comes from our uh, planning and zoning department. Michael Sandy is our planning director. Michael, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Board of Commissioners. Just give me one minute. Let me load this up. Show me the card. Michael's bringing up the presentation that he wants to make for us. He has several slides. What he's here to do tonight is to discuss the uh, a proposal for a uh, county a Stanley minimum housing ordinance. Uh, it is something that uh, he has presented to commissioners uh, back several months ago and is wanting to try to make sure that we get this proposal out in front of the public and in preparation uh, for uh, potentially holding a public hearing uh, at the next, the next meeting. So you ready to roll? Very good. Thank you, Mr. Very Chairman. Good. Before you tonight is a um, is give you a short presentation of the minimum housing proposal for Stanley County. Um, it's one of the issues that we have on a regular basis in, in Stanley County is, is minimum housing. Uh, we have a lot of um, people call when weather changes. For example, it starts getting cold. We've had people call about uh, their housing conditions, and there's really not a whole lot we can do about those. Some of the topics I'll try to cover tonight. Um, in short presentation is what is minimum housing? Um, how do we, how do you adopt a minimum housing code? Uh, give me some examples of some violations, um, type of uh, enforcement is complaint versus active enforcement. And also a uh, conclusion of what where we may need to go from here. It's actually a picture here from Stanley County. This is um, some of our housing stock out in the rural areas. Um, some of the urban areas, you, you can kind of expect that as houses deteriorate, but uh, we also have these kind of problems in rural areas. They do they do exist a little more than than uh, you would expect. Minimum housing codes uh, establish the basic minimum requirement for for a place to be fit for human habitation that is acceptable to someone's living uh, place. Typical requirements include structural soundness. Of course, that's to prevent the collapse of walls or floors. You want adequate ventilation um, and safety, a safe water supply, and toilet facilities. I think those are self-explanatory. Um, another picture of a house that may have some minimum housing issues. 
Um, as far as inspections, if an inspector finds that a building does not meet the minimum standards, the inspector can order it to be repaired or closed. Uh, the governing board, which would be you, can adopt an ordinance ordering that the building which is beyond repair be demolished. Uh, most of North Carolina larger cities and some counties have a minimum housing code. I copied some of those uh, that I'm able to find throughout the state. Uh, they are 19 counties out of the 100 counties do have a minimum housing standard code. Uh, most municipalities of, uh, of you know, throughout the state, I think there's 400 and some municipalities, most of those do have some kind of minimum housing code. Uh, Stanley, uh, in Stanley County, the municipalities listed the Al as Albemarle, Baden, Locust, New London, and Norwood um, have minimum housing codes. How do you adopt a minimum housing code? Um, counties can adopt it following the public hearing. Ordinance has to meet the state minimum standards, which are spelled out in the general statutes. Options can include how often inspections are performed, what triggers a valid housing complaint, and fines related to the code violation. You bring up one thing about code violations. You have major violations, which we talked about briefly about condemnation, not condemnation, but uh, closures and orders to demolish. Then you have code violations where you can actually issue fines. You cannot find people who have houses that are beyond repair. This is some examples of some uh, structure and plumbing issues. As you can see here, they got water damage in addition to some plumbing problems under their house. It's the actual electric box here in, in the county that, you know, I'm not an electrician, but there's, you open the box up and there's some, some issues that need to be addressed. Um, leaky roof and damaged ceiling as a result um, can quickly damage and deteriorate a house from the inside. Um, this is a house actually in Baden, one of the quadruplexes. And this house had several major issues um, that the owners actually are working toward resolving. Jurisdiction, this, uh, if the county were to adopt a minimum housing ordinance, it would apply throughout the county jurisdiction, not just the zoning jurisdiction. It would apply up to the municipal, the municipal boundary. Um, so those areas that the city's claim is EPJ would also be affected by a county minimum housing. We talked about the type of enforcement, uh, complaint driven versus active enforcement. Um, the draft ordinance that you have before you um, is actually um, a complaint driven ordinance. Inspections um, sources could be filed through the building or housing inspector. Uh, petition signed by five different residences in, uh, in the county, county citizens. The tenant actually that was living there can file a petition. Uh, government agency requests uh, via petition would be like social services, health department, or fire and law enforcement. Um, and also the owner of the property can request a petition. Uh, options to trigger complaint may be put in the ordinance or systematic inspections of all structures, um, but that's not what we're, we're proposing at this time. Emergency situations and those uh, coming to our attention, uh, under these circumstances, the uh, inspector shall issue a 48-hour repair or vacate notice. Those would be for major items such as broken or burst or inoperable plumbing or no water service, unsafe or exposed wiring or no electrical service, dangerous cooking or heating equipment, dangerous fuel storage or fuel lines, or unclean or un unsanitary conditions. With the conclusion, staffing uh, will have another tool in our toolbox to be able to help with unsafe and unsightly housing. Tax values would increase over time due to value of property in question. Um, and and the property question and the adjacent property improve safety for citizens in those unsafe structures. Also hold landlords more accountable for their rental property. Uh, bring up standards of housing stock throughout the county. Offer visual improvements for economic development um, and assist in high grass around those houses. Be glad to answer any questions. Do commissioners have any questions or comments of mine for this evening? I do. First of all, I found a misspelled word, and you'll probably catch that with the draft. Was that the Page indicated? 10, <laughs> sanitary, the word sanitary. Okay. Misspelled. Section 9, minimum standards for safe and sanitary maintenance. Page 11, tall grass. 
It says eight, no more than 18 inches. And that comes up to your knee. <laughs> Why won't we go 8 inches or 10 inches or 12 inches? Is most, that something you could change? Or? Yeah, most municipalities do 12. Um, that was a number we had to kind of justify with being our rural nature of the county, um, trying to balance that. Um, as you can tell from other ordinances I've had to, you know, bring before you before, it's a balancing act between these urban areas and the rural areas and what's fair enough for you. Um, you know, maybe in a, in a tightened neighborhood, 18 inches would be a lot. But some areas where you have larger, you know, larger lots or it, it's, it's a number that you have to pick. So well, I know that 18 inches would be an improvement for the house across the street from me. But absolutely. <laughs> but I think uh, anyway, we, we, we tossed around 12 inches be a lot better even out. In yeah, we tossed wilderness. around 12. We did toss around 12, but, you know, that can be changed. I just make that a suggestion. Any other questions or comments concerning the uh, draft here? Okay, hearing none, um, the, uh, the request that we have before us tonight is for the county commissioners to schedule a, a public hearing uh, for Monday, October the 1st to receive public comment. Um, what's your pleasure? I make a motion that we set the public hearing for October 1st. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner McIntyre with a second by Commissioner Louder to set a public hearing for October 1st to um, consider uh, the uh, proposed uh, Stanley Minimum Housing Ordinance. Okay. Uh, any, uh, um, all in favor of that motion say aye. Any opposed? So we'll schedule this for the um, first. And um, I guess you want to tell us now or, or let us know where these uh, this draft may be uh, available. Um, first of all, it'll be available um, on the Planning Department website. There'll also be copies available in the County Manager's office, in my office, um, at the, in the public libraries. Um, and I'll be glad to send them. If anybody would request my email, I'll be glad to send them also by electronic. Very good, because this is something we obviously want people to, to weigh in on, just like we were talking earlier about the uh, the animal ordinance. We want people's input, and, and this is going to be something very, very important to us. So we do encourage folks to uh, uh, either contact uh, our, our offices or look on our website or ask for uh, the, the plan to be sent to you individually. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is concerning board and committee appointments. Our presenter is our county manager, Andy Lucas. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, thank you. Um, the first item you have before you is the um, consideration of appointments to the Community Oversight Board for the new organization, Cardinal Innovations Healthcare Solutions, which um, replaced Piedmont Behavioral Health uh, earlier this year. Um, the county um, had uh, appointed uh, Commissioner Morton Barbara Whitley and Dale Poplin to the the larger um, general board of the public of the Piedmont Behavioral Health. As a result of that organization, that's not, I don't know if dissolving is the real is the is the the right word, but in some essence they did dissolve, and a new organization has been found or been established with a with a new governing board. Um, those appointments go away, and they're essentially wiped clean. And so, um, but as a result of the the structure of the new organization, Cardinal Innovations Healthcare Solutions, um, the county has the opportunity to appoint three members to a community oversight board. Um, and so this evening, um, there are, you know, there's a letter in your packet asking for us to make those um, appointments. Um, you may not have all the information you need, and you may want to take some time with this. I know Commissioner Morton may have some thoughts about uh, the commissioner appointee. Um, I do know that Sharon Scott has uh, expressed some interest, not, although not uh, not officially yet, in terms of being possibly even the commissioner's designee because she interacts with um, the mental health services so closely with her organization, and so she may be able to um, provide that oversight at the, the community level. Um, I know Dale Poplin has also expressed some interest in continuing to serve as the an individual who has a family member. Um, and so there's still... You know, you may be able to um, appoint some folks. 
I know the letter says before October 1st, but I think in, in lieu of um, not receiving this information and us only having one meeting, it may be difficult. And I would, I would possibly encourage you to just take some additional time. Let us, uh, I know that Sharon has contacted Anna Yan with social services to make sure there's no conflicts of interest of her possibly um, participating. And, and then maybe you all taking action uh, at your October 1st meeting um, on this specific item, but certainly um, that, I don't want to, I don't want to stop you from taking action on any appointments that you may want to make this evening. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Sounds like a reasonable suggestion, but I wanted to find out if there's any comments or questions by commission. I make one comment. This, uh, the governing board, of course, is I mean, the Cardinal Innovative Solutions now consists of 15 counties, and uh, the oversight board, the former PBH board, five counties can stand their union. Cabarrus, Davis, and Lowe, and that's going to be the oversight board now. And that board will not be a governing board. It simply will be addressing uh, service issues that arise in that district. So that's when I talked to the county manager about it, because under the resolution that we adopted last spring, under um, section three and the governance. Subsection three, I mean, a, and subsection eight of that, it says three members in each county appointed by each county board of commission to lead to a county commission or designee. I suggested to the uh, county manager Ricketts that we designate a person in the office that would hold that position, that position, such as either in such as the Department of Social Services or public health because those those positions have a better idea as to the needs of, that would be addressed by the oversight board. And also when when I while I was on that board, Bill Proplin has a member of his family that is deceased of services and he expressed a direct interest in that. Um, the other member of the board, uh, Dr. Sawson, has attended a lot of the meetings and he has expressed he has um, made many comments and suggestions at the meetings and I think I would even I think the board may just in my opinion to consider uh, contacting him and seeing if he is an interest in serving on this oversight board since he is a doctor and since he has been in contact with about most of the uh, needs for this area so uh, I just want to make those comments as, as we uh, look at it very good thank you um, it does sound like though that uh, we're interested in just making the appointments at that time is that correct okay so um, we will um, move uh, those appointments and and um, Josh um, would you recommend uh, our staff uh, uh, for someone particular contacting dr. Sausman I know he did a good job while I was on the, the board there for a short period while he was as well I want to make that recommendation Staff, yes. If, if you will, then, um, Mr. Manager, uh, take contact with Dr. Sausman and uh, find out if he's interested. And uh, those are good suggestions. Thank you, Josh. Um, we have a second um, appointment uh, that we have on our agenda tonight. And uh, again, our presenter is Andy Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, we have a recent vacancy to the Economic Development Commission. Uh, Mr. Paul Trill just recently resigned. And in fact, we um, was effective Monday, August 27th. And so we bring that to you for information this evening. Uh, this, uh, this member um, serves from the Central District. Um, and so that will be uh, his unex unexpired term will run through January 31st of 2014. And so that is an, uh, a position that you have for your consideration. Uh, we do have um, some ap one initial application um, for consideration, but with, there's been very limited time since the, we just received this information last week, but we wanted to make sure you had it since we had an opportunity to get this on this agenda so that you could be thinking about uh, folks who maybe have an interest in applying so that you would um, have a, um, a full slate of uh, applicants to consider. So um, we have that for your consideration this evening. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? I just think that we could spend some time and, and maybe find somebody. 
let let folks have an opportunity to apply for that. Very right. good. Uh, Chairman of the EDC, I would like to have, I mean, I know it's real quick and we ain't had time to do it and let's don't rush into it. Let's get the full application, not saying the advice wouldn't make us a good one, but let's get us a full slate of officers to look at. And, and with that, um, as we do often uh, during the, the broadcast or, or through the media, uh, ask for citizens who are interested in serving to contact uh, the county, uh, not only for this uh, vacancy, but there are I think something like 30 different boards that we uh, that we need people to serve on. So if you're interested in um, in uh, serving the county, let us know. Particularly uh, uh, in the next month, if you're interested in serving uh, on the EDC board, let us know. Thank you. Uh, and we have one other uh, appointment uh, appointment to consider. Yes, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, I will just back up one quick second and say that that current vacancy for the EDC is from the central district, and someone would have to re reside in. Um, the Albemarle area because those would be the voting precincts that would align to the central district. So I don't want to make sure everyone's that's clear for folks out there who may be interested. Um, the next item is the um, Senior Services Advisory Board um, and there's five members. Uh, three of the five members have served for a two for two three year terms and can't be reappointed. Uh, there are two remaining individuals who can be appointed according to their bylaws. Um, Robert um, Three names are being submitted for approval as new advisory members. The two that um, who wish to be reappointed that can be are Vanessa Chambers and um, Dr. Marianne Bumgarner Davis. And so, for your consideration this evening, are the reappointment of those two members and the appointment of uh, three new members: um, Robin Lentz, uh, Bud Morton, and Wayne Sasser. Uh, and those uh, have come forth from. Um, Senior Services Advisory Board for your consideration. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, what's, your board? what's your pleasure, board? Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. I'd request the appointment of Robin Lentz, E.H. Bud Morton Jr. and Wayne Sasser and the reappointment of Vanessa Chambers and Dr. Marianne Bumgarner Davis to the Senior Services Advisory Board. With terms expiring 9-30-2015. We have a motion by uh, Commissioner Louder and a second by Commissioner Morton. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And again, we appreciate those individuals willing to serve on that board as well. Next item on our agenda is the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners uh, has asked us to look at some uh, legislative goals for 2013-2014, um, and our presenter to discuss these tonight is our county manager. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, thank you again. The North Carolina Association of County Commissioners, who's the main lobbying uh, body for counties uh, in the General Assembly, is uh, preparing to put together their um, legislative goals for the 2013-2014 uh, biennium, uh, the two-year period of both the long session and the short session uh, of the General Assembly. And the General Assembly will go back into, um, will be called back to order in, in January of 2013. Um, as a result of that, they're asking for counties by no later than seven, September 17th to submit any items uh, of interest that have a broad statewide uh, impact. Um, staff have put together um, four for your consideration. I think three of them really are, are already sort of goals that have been addressed in the past um, that weren't accomplished um, or were semi-accomplished and we want to make sure that those um, get done. I think are high priorities for, for staff. Um, there's a number four is really a new one and that really just speaks to the energy conservation code and it's not so much that uh, staff has a concern about the energy conservation code in, it, in its nature certainly conservation is good we've done our own share of HVAC and other kinds of things here to try to save energy so that's a good thing I think the concern is that if, if North Carolina is the only state that has that in place what impact is that going to have on uh, economic development um, and competing against other states um, if the price of uh, construction is uh, goes up as a result of meeting those requirements and so um, you know if companies are uh, going to have an interest in saving money they'll invest in you know um, lead uh, facility buildings and energy conservation measures uh, to save money on their own bottom line and the return on shareholders and so it, it may be that um, that we've jumped the gun we don't know but I think there may be some some um, 
some prudence in looking at um, whether or not our economic development or our state energy conservation code, what impact that may have on economic development across the state. And so um, that's, a, that's a new one that we would ask maybe the board's consideration in asking um, the, the association and possibly the General Assembly to take a look at as they convene their um, long session in January. Um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, the board, what we'd ask for the board is to um, to consider and discuss and possibly approve these items, and then we would include uh, that uh, those motions in our um, in our submittal of these uh, any of the alleged the items that you um, approve this evening to the association prior to September 17th. Are, are there any other items? I know um, we have about uh, five pages of goals um, that um, um, the uh, association has looked at in the past. And uh, of course, you have the option tonight to add any of those that you would like um, uh, onto the list that the staff has provided, as well as um, um, edit the, the list that the staff has provided for us tonight. Um, there were a couple that I was interested in, at least hearing your thoughts about. One had to do with. Um, and uh, uh, Commissioner McIntyre actually uh, had, had, had talked with me about this one, was to um, um, authorize uh, the local, you can find this on the, on the last page under tax and finance, uh, number two, it says authorize local revenue options, uh, seek legislation to allow all counties to enact by resolution or the option of the Board of Commissioners by vote or referendum any or all revenue options from among those that have been authorized for any other county. I know our association has looked into this and we've yet to get the, uh, the legislature to adopt that, but uh, really it's just an opportunity for us, for, for example, in Stanley County to take a, a vote to the, to the voters uh, without having to get uh, permission by the uh, General Assembly. Uh, if, if someone else is doing it, can we also do it? And um, I'd be interested uh, to possibly add that to the list or hear your thoughts about adding that to the list. If, and the other one I saw on here, I can't seem to find it now, but I think it had to do with um, um, utilizing electronic notice of public hearings and other legal notices. It is actually on the third page under intergovernmental relations. It's number eight. It says authorize electronic notice of public hearings and other legal notices. I might you know, direct a question to either our clerk or to our manager. This says to seek legislation to provide counties with options for notice of public hearings, notice of delinquent taxpayers, and other legal notices through electronic means. I know we still are utilizing um, the press for that, and it seems like to me in this day and age that we ought to be able to um, utilize electronic notices either as well, or I don't know if that's in addition to or in lieu of, but uh, uh, those are two items that, that, I, that I found interesting in this list. I don't know if anybody else had any items that they would like to either add or, or discuss tonight. I agree with the two you just said, and I'd also like to look at number seven on intergovernmental affairs or relations, uh, elimination of second primaries and runoff elections. Uh, my understanding that uh, Stanley County spent probably excess of $30,000 just to do that, and we had uh, some precincts in North Carolina had no one show up to vote and some a lot that had only one. I think it's a waste of time and money. I'd like to see that one put back in. So I'd, I would agree with the two you, you talked about and also with that one. Um, I think that's a good one too, uh, Commissioner McIntyre, because it, what, what, was, what was discovered is that it doesn't ever, the research says it doesn't change. It doesn't change the outcome either. We're spending money without changing the outcome. So I think that's certainly something for us to continue to study. Anybody else? I, I guess what we need then would be a motion um, to um, uh, support uh, and approve the legislative items that uh, the staff has provided and to add these three that have been mentioned tonight. Make that motion, sir. We have a motion, we have a motion by Commissioner McIntyre. We have a second by Commissioner Louder that we submit the seven items that we spoke of tonight uh, to the association to be considered as their legislative goals. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? One sign. Okay, thank you. Is that uh, what you need? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next item is uh, a clarification uh, for being provided to us on a request that we actually uh, heard at our August the 6th board meeting concerning um, um, 
donated uh, items, and um, our presenter tonight uh, for that will be our County Manager, Andy Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, at the August 6th meeting, uh, Representative Homes of Hope approached the board about uh, donating surplus property, specifically um, desktop computers. And general statutes certainly allow the board to do that. We currently um, surplus all of our property using an online um, auction site, uh, GovDeals, and it has paid dividends. Um, we have actually seen our um, uh, revenues increase uh, through this means of um, donating property because we can do it multiple times a year uh, and then it broadens the audience by which uh, to bid um, and I believe that uh, you know to change that process or to donate to a nonprofit and it may start with computers but the next thing you all may be requested for vehicles and other things and so it's sort of a slippery slope I think that you know these computers certainly the Homes of Hope is a, is a good organization and they do good things and we want to be supportive but at the same time these computers sell for a fairly nominal cost uh, out, uh, and they would have an opportunity, they have an opportunity to bid on these things like everyone else. Um, and certainly we'd be even willing to work with them if there were five or six computers that they were interested in, we could put, package them together as a lot and put them out on the auction site individually um, or as a group, and they would have the opportunity to bid on those along with anybody else out there um, that has access to the internet uh, to bid. And so we just feel like our, our um, our current process uh, provides a level playing field, um, and you know it, it maximizes our our non our non property tax revenues, and it's our recommendation at this time that uh, the board just maintain this approach to uh, surplusing property. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Does anyone have a question? Hearing none, what's your uh, recommendation? Make a motion we accept recommendation to maintain current process for disposal surplus personal property. A motion by Commissioner McIntyre and a second by Commissioner Lowder to accept the staff recommendation. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, last uh, agenda item is the consent agenda. I would entertain a motion to approve. So moved. We have a motion by Commissioner Dennis and a second by Commissioner McIntyre to approve the consent agenda. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Con consider the consent agenda approved. Um, we always have a um, Typically, we have a time for public comment. Uh, I don't see anyone in the room right now um, uh, that uh, may be interested in making a public comment. Anyone who would like to may come forward or wave you down. Um, otherwise, we have an opportunity for general comments, and I will start on my right with Commissioner Dennis. Commissioner Louder. Go all the way to my left with Commissioner Morton. Commissioner McIntyre. No comment. County Attorney. No comment, thank you. Uh, county manager. No comment, thank you. Okay. The only the only comment I had tonight was I wanted to uh, uh, congratulate our, our airport authority on adding uh, Presley Aviation. Um, they're going to be providing a service out there, uh, renting an old terminal and uh, providing a service, teaching people how to fly. Uh, it will be good for our county and will bring people here, and uh, we certainly wish them the best, and we're glad that they are a part of our our operations. I believe we've signed a lease. Uh, they will. They will have uh, some people located out there. They will be teaching, and, and that provides jobs. And it also, uh, that they will be uh, uh, taking over the responsibility of paying the utilities for the terminal, which will save the county money. So, and also based in four aircraft too. Yeah, that's right. And the, the, the and taxes on that too, right? And that's the hometown board that yep. is going to be the flight instructor right. that's now going to be working in Stanley County. Right. Very good. So we're excited about that and we welcome them. Um, at this time, I would uh, consider um, a motion that we go into closed session in accordance uh, with uh, general statutes to discuss 401 water quality permit intervention, the uh, public records, and um, consult with an attorney, uh, uh, attorney on a class action lawsuit. So moved. Motion by uh, Commissioner McIntyre. I thought you sent it to McIntyre. Commissioner McIntyre and Commissioner Dennis, all in favor say aye. Aye. We, we are in closed session. 